going to try to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Okay, I think it's working. Um, all right, so a uh, quick little intro from me. Welcome to the Akron Software Craftsmanship Meetup. Um, we meet on the third Thursday of every month, uh, and we discuss a wide variety of agnostic development-focused topics. Um, we started in 2019, and prior to everyone's lives changing, we met at the uh, Bounce Innovation Hub on the third Thursday of every month. Now everything is digital uh, and for the foreseeable future. Um, my name is Mark Harwood. I work at Robert Half Technology, which is a massive staffing and consulting firm. So obligatory promotion. Um, Robert Half is here to help out any IT workers who are looking for a new job or any businesses that are looking for IT talent. I personally manage an internal team of developers that we have. It consists of 15 consultants who work with companies on specific projects. Uh, we've done projects relating to web and mobile app development, business intelligence, DevOps, and agile training over the past five years. So if, if that sounds interesting, let me know. Um, now that that's out of the way, I also wanted to let everyone know that the uh, Cleveland and Canton tech communities have public slacks that you can access. Um, if uh, you're looking to like connect and collaborate with people in our region, um, please let me know. They're awesome groups. And if you'd like an invite to either or both, just say something in the chat and I will drop the invite links. Uh, and then finally, our presenter tonight is Sean McPhee. He's a software developer at PRC Saltillo, uh, yep. which is a company located in Wooster uh, that makes speech generating devices. Um, he's going to talk to us this evening about Native, uh, which is a Kubernetes based platform uh, that you use to deploy modern serverless workloads. So Sean, thank you for, for being the presenter tonight and the floor is yours. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. Okay. So, um, like I said, I've got just a couple of slides and uh, then we'll go through some of the official tutorials. Um, feel free to interrupt me to ask questions at any point. Um, and there'll be some times where we're waiting for, you know, an image to build or something where there'll be an opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, so Knative is a uh, open source project. It's, it was started and is headed by Google. Um, they, they have, it hasn't been like turned over like Kubernetes um, after a while was turned over to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and they're, they're sort of the governing body for that now. Um, Knative is something that has a board um, that governs it, I think. Google has like two or three seats um, on that governing council. And then like, I wanna say, you know, VMware and maybe Cisco and a couple of others are involved with it as well, but it's an open source thing that anybody can contribute to. Um, and it's basically just a layer that you can put on top of Kubernetes to uh, run serverless um, workloads. So uh, knative.dev, I always like to, you know, point out the official documentation sites and stuff. So knative.dev is the official site for knative itself. Um, and then what we're going to be going through tutorials for is Google Cloud Run, which is part of the Google Cloud platform. And um, the docs for that are here at cloud.google.com slash run slash docs. Um, and we'll be looking more at that. So you can, you know, if you have your own Kubernetes clusters, um, you can host Knative yourself. Um, you can run it on a developer machine with something like Minikube, which is a, you know, local emulation of a cluster basically on your developer machine. Um, and so Cloud Run is just, you know, Google's uh, offering um, for a managed Knative service where you don't have to set up Kubernetes or Knative, but that's what you're running on. Okay, so I have a few slides here. So 
so yeah, so this is specifically manage K native with Google Cloud Run. So, you know, this doesn't involve any setup on our part, really. So what is K native? It's a serverless compute platform. So what that means is, you know, it's going to run your like web application, right? It's going to, it's going to be the compute resource for your web app and serverless means that you know, I think as most people who are familiar with the term know, it doesn't mean there aren't servers. It just means that you're not managing them. Somebody else is managing them. And so Knative consists architecturally of basically two components in an, an eventing component, which is how the different services that you're um, creating communicate with each other. Um, and then and we'll see that in the third tutorial a little bit. And then the serving component is the one that's actually, you know, hosting and running whatever your service is. The serving uh, component has a couple of different sort of conceptual pieces to it. Uh, it's the service itself, um, routing. Uh, the routing here is like, uh, you'll have multiple revisions um, of your service. And so like each time you create a new container image, each time you push new commits of your code of your application, it'll create a new revision. And by default, it'll route to the latest revision. Um, but you can change that routing if you want to do, uh, you know, A-B testing, if you want to, which A-B testing is like if you have uh, something new that you want to try out and maybe you just want to release it to like a, a subset of your user base that is opted into you know getting beta features or something like that you can set it up so okay the this subset of traffic will be routed to this new revision but all the existing other traffic will be routed to the current stable revision um, that kind of thing and the configuration involves, you know, setting up those sort of details. Like, do you want 50% of traffic routed to the new revision and 50% routed to the previous revision? You know, just to see if, to work out if there are any bugs in it, if you're, you know, the kind of place that tests in production in that way. Um, it, like I said, it's Kubernetes based. Um, but you don't have to really know anything, especially for like the managed stuff that we're looking at here today. You don't have to know or understand anything about Kubernetes to use it really. Um, it's portable to any cloud-based or on-site cluster. So if you know, you're a company that's concerned about getting locked into any particular cloud provider, this is an option. Um, for you where you could, you know, maybe you even still have some of your own compute resources on site. Um, you could run it on there and run it, you know, on one or more public clouds as well. And uh, the, the other really nice feature about it, which is sort of like one of the main selling points of any serverless uh, compute platform is that it scales to zero. So you're paying for usage if your site is getting, you know, no traffic at a particular time of day or on particular days, you won't be incurring any cost. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if you have a real busy time in a particular season or on particular days, it can auto scale to handle, you know, whatever load your sort of budget can tolerate. And so this is similar if, if anyone's familiar with functions as a service like AWS Lambda um, or Google Cloud Functions, those kinds of things. Um, it's, this is similar to that in, in that it's a serverless compute platform. But one of the benefits of this over that is there's more runtime flexibility. So like AWS Lambda, I'm not sure. I think nowadays it's actually running on like really small VMs. Um, but you don't have any real control over that environment. Um, you can probably find in the docs what it's running, like Linux x86, 64, I imagine, but you can't really count on anything in the environment. Um, and it only supports certain languages. 
uh, because of that, because they have to have that language's runtime available um, to your function. So this is more sort of like containers as a service. So you can package pretty much anything that you want into your container. Um, we'll see in the second tutorial, a case where we use a uh, system package um, to that we make calls to it to produce our output. Um, so that kind of runtime flexibility, and you can do this. We're going to use Go um, today in the examples, but uh, there's examples in the tutorials that we're seeing for Java, C Sharp, PHP, uh, all kinds of things, Rust, Elixir, and then there's community tutorials as well for pretty much any language you can think of. And, and so the only real requirement is that, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and point out here, when you're on the doc site, it takes you to the guides. If you go to the reference here, you can see this container contract. So this is, you know, the only real requirements that your container has to meet to be able to run um, on Google Cloud Run, um, which again is an implementation of Knative. So yeah, anything your executables, you can have any kind of executable in your container image um, as long as it's compiled for Linux 64 bit and technically speaking, anything that's compatible with the Linux x86 64 ABI, which is a, like an API, but a binary interface. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see some of this stuff. I won't go through all of this. We'll see some of this stuff in the tutorials, but like one of the other major things is that you just set up your container to listen on whatever port is defined by a port environment variable. And that's how it knows uh, where to pick up traffic from. And, um, Another difference with functions as a service, so functions as a service, like every request that's made spins up a new instance of the function. Um, in this case, a container can service multiple requests. Um, I believe I have it in here somewhere later, but I think the, the default is 80 requests. So if you're getting, you know, 86 simultaneous requests, then at that point, it'll spin up a second container to help serve the, that load. Okay, so that was Knative. So what is fully managed Cloud Run? It's just Google Cloud's Knative offering, like I've been saying, and it's focused mainly, the, our interaction with it is mainly focused on the service and revision resources that I had mentioned previously. Um, it audit, like I said, it automatically routes requests to the latest healthy revision. So every time you uh, create a new container image, that creates a new revision. Um, and you can set it up. I'm going to, in the interest of showing in detail how everything works in the tutorials, we'll be manually building the images. But you can also set them up. Um, if you look in the docs, they have a lot of how-to guides here that are really helpful. And um, I believe under deploy here and deploying uh, or continuous deployment from Git here, it explains how you can set it up so that every time you push source code changes to Git, it will automatically rebuild your corresponding containers. And like I mentioned, it's usage-based pricing. So you can uh, control that in several ways. Um, you know, if you don't expect a lot of load um, at any given point, then, you know, it'll never cost you very much. You may even stay in the free tier. Um, if you look under resources in the docs, if you're interested in the details of pricing, that's where you can find the pricing details and quotas and limits. Um, like what I did with my account is I just set up a budget on my Google account, Google Cloud account overall that says, you know, I don't want to spend more than X a month. 
And so I'll get a notification at like 50% of that budget and then at 90% of that budget. Um, but you can also control like the number of containers that you want it to limit itself to uh, creating concurrently. You can limit, you know, how much it'll auto scale. So like if you don't, you know, want it to just blow up all of a sudden and, and have a huge bill um, because of a, a giant increase in traffic, you can, you can set a max on how many containers it'll auto scale to. And uh, the quotas that I showed uh, mentioned this kind of stuff, but it's, it's limited to a thousand revisions per service. Um, so again, that's like your, your container history, more or less. Um, it defaults to auto scaling of a thousand containers per service. So if you do get a spike in traffic and you don't, you know, change any of the defaults, it could go up to a thousand containers per service that you're running. And it defaults to the maximum concurrency of 80 requests per container. Depending on what your code is doing, your container may not be able to handle multiple requests. Um, so if that's the case, you know, you can set the maximum concurrency to one so that it'll create a new container for each new request if your service is coded in a way that requires that. Um, and each container is limited to two virtual CPUs and two gigabytes of memory um, in terms of its uh, resource consumption. So this is mainly, uh, you know, for microservice type architecture. Okay, and that is the slides. Any questions there? Okay, so now we'll jump into the tutorials. And the first one that we're going to do is just a real introductory one about how to build and deploy a container. So there's a couple of things. Um, the, the first thing is, you know, obviously you need a Google Cloud uh, platform account that's free. And when you if you've never signed up for it before, when you first sign up for it, I think they give you like $300 in credits that last for like a year or so. Um, and then there's an always free tier. So like even after those credits expire, if you're, you know, just doing your own projects, you're just learning stuff or, you know, you're making an application that doesn't, uh, you know, get a ton of traffic, you may end up always in that free tier. It's like a certain number of invocations every month and a certain amount of uh, download bandwidth and, and things of that nature. Um, and then you also, if you just want to like, you know, do these tutorials on your own and you don't want to set up uh, the G Cloud CLI or you might not even need your own account necessarily. I'm not entirely sure about that. There's this thing called Quick Labs where it'll, you know, it's like trainings for Google Cloud Platform where it'll create a virtual environment for you and you're interacting with it entirely in your browser. Um, and so you can run through all these kinds of things and it'll create the resources for you. There's a time limit to it, but it's usually much more than you would need to complete the tutorial. Okay, so that's another option. So before we begin, if you're gonna, you know, set it up like you would uh, be on, a, on your developer machine, you wanna make sure that you have a project. So that's the first thing I'll do here in a minute is, is create a project. Projects are basically like your buckets for a set of resources in Google Cloud Platform. Um, and then you need to make sure that billing is enabled for that project. So even if you're still, if you just signed up and you have the $300 credits and you're still just in the free tier of usage, you still have to set up billing to use certain things um, in case you know you go over the limits. So it's, it's good when you sign up to set up your budget. Um, so let me just show that real quick. Once you've signed up, you'll have this like GUI console access here. And if you go to billing in this menu on the left, there's, uh, well, I don't necessarily want to expose my billing account information and stuff, but if you pick 
uh, your billing account, there'll be a little box that says uh, like health check of your billing account and it'll give you tips like setting up a budget. So I would advise anyone to go, you know, go here to billing, pick your billing account and um, look at those recommendations and um, it will give you uh, pointers basically to, to set that up. It's, it's really easy. Um, so anytime you make a project, you got to set the billing up. And then um, if you haven't already, you have to install the cloud SDK, which um, I posted in the, in the comments of the meetup, how to go about that. There's a link to, uh, depending on your operating system, they have instructions for, for that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get um, some environment variables here for different things that I need. So G cloud is the command line interface um, that we're going to use for doing these kinds of deployments and stuff. Um, you can also use the console, which is like the browser GUI. Um, so if you just sign up as an individual with your um, email address, you won't have an organization, right? Your organization will be this no organization and you can just create projects in that. Um, if you do have like a domain and you want to set up an organization to sort of manage the um, access and what like uh, different people, you know, if you have an organization with different people serving different roles where you want to like billing account manager and, you know, somebody who's allowed to create projects and somebody who's allowed to create certain kinds of resources and not others, then you can uh, sign up for either G Suite, if you already have that, um, but that's something that, you know, has a monthly cost associated with it. If you want an organization and you don't uh, need G Suite, there's something called Cloud Identity that you can sign up for, and that's free. So that's basically what I did. So I have this mcdovshe.org domain, and so that allows me to um, have an organization and then I can create folders, which is just a way to organize your projects um, within an organization. And um, you can have folders within folders, like I have this cloud run tutorials within sandboxes. So I'm gonna create a project in there. So first I wanna get my organization ID and just store it because we're gonna need that. So the G Cloud command line, uh, is really well documented. If you do G Cloud help, it will tell you all the main groups and commands that you can access. And then, you know, when you see one that you want, like organizations, you can do G Cloud help organizations, and it'll tell you all of the subcommands of that. So like you can work your way down. It's a really big tool in terms of, you know, it covers everything on Google Cloud Platform, but you can sort of work your way into that uh, help to see and the documentation for the G cloud command if you're not, um, if you don't like command line stuff is also available in the docs. So um, like here we went to G cloud or to cloud.google.com slash run. If you went to cloud.google.com SDK docs, that would give you all the docs for not only the G cloud command line utility, but if you wanted to incorporate this, like if you wanted to write an app that used the G Cloud APIs to spin up stuff, that's where you would go to find that kind of information. Okay, so G Cloud organizations list is going to list out all of the organizations that I have access to. It's just one, so I don't need to filter it, but I do want to use this format option and say that I want the value of the name. So basically all I'm doing here, because other commands that I use are going to need the organization ID. So I'm just storing the organization ID that I get from this G cloud command into a um, variable within my shell here. All right. And then like we saw in the um, GUI, there's a folder within that. So I'm going to get that folder. So that'll be G Cloud Resource Manager 
list organization and then here's where I can use that one that I just made. And again, I only have one folder in that organization, so I don't need to use the filter option. I can say name here. And so now my folder ID will be in there. Oh, invalid choice list, oops. Okay, so what I forgot here is folder manager folders. And again, you can find the details of these commands that I'm typing with it. So like if you wanted to know what all the options in resource manager are, you do G cloud help resource manager and it would tell you about folders. And then you could do G cloud help resource manager folders and it would tell you list is one of the options in there and it would tell you that organization and format are options to apply to that command. And then lastly, I have a subfolder. And so the, the thing to note about this stuff is um, these, these layers you wouldn't have if you just are signing up as an individual and you know just creating projects. You wouldn't have an organization and you wouldn't necessarily have folders within that organization. So here I'm telling it to list all of the folders within that folder ID and the format is me telling it that of all the information that it would otherwise spit out about that, I just want the name. Okay, so now I can create the project. So G Cloud, and just to demonstrate what this looks like. So if I do G Cloud help, it opens up the manual page. Again, this is available in the docs too, if you prefer a, a GUI in the browser. Um, and I can go down through here and it'll show me the groups. So these are sort of like all of the different things on Google Cloud Platform assets, authorization, uh, components, compute resources, database stuff. And so um, going down through here, I see projects, create and manage project access policies. So I can do G Cloud help projects. And then that will tell me the options that I have within that. So create to create a new project. So if I forget it or I didn't know it, that's how I can find out, you know, what commands to be using here. Um, so G Cloud Projects Create, and I'm going to tell it I wanted to create it in that subfolder. And I can specify a name. Um, so we'll call this Building and Deploying. And you might, you may only have one project um, in your account. If you have multiple projects though, you need to tell it when you run commands, what project you want it to use uh, for the commands that you're running. You can specify that with every command, but that gets annoying. Um, so when you create a project, there's this flag to set it as the default and that will automatically update your G Cloud config file to um, basically automatically supply that project as the project to use for all subsequent commands. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And I specifically didn't provide a project ID. And the reason that I advise not to do that, like if you're making a permanent project and you want a particular name, go ahead and do that. But the project IDs have to be globally unique. So they not only do they have to be unique within your organization, they have to be unique across the whole world, right? So if somebody else in their Google Cloud Platform has used that project ID, it's not available to you. So if you do manage to get one you like, you're not gonna ever wanna delete it. So here, you know, I'm just going through tutorials. This is a project that I'm going to delete when we're done. So I don't want to use up, you know, a, a name for that. So if you don't pro provide a project ID, then it'll generate one for you. Basically, it'll take 
you know, whatever name, whatever display name, whatever nice looking name you gave it. And it'll, you know, uh, kebab case that and, and slap a random number on the end uh, to make it unique. So that, that's a good idea to do if you're making projects that are just for you to learn something. Okay, so it's setting up the project now. Enabling uh, Cloud API service on the project. And notice the last line there, updated property core project to building and deploying. So had I not specified um, that set as default flag, I could instead have done gcloud config set project um, building and deploying, yada, yada, yada. So that's the way to set your config, you know, if you want to change projects later on. Set as a default is just a convenience feature there. Okay, so now I need to enable billing. So I'm going to uh, use gcloud config get value project. So this is going to return me the project ID so that I have that in a variable to use. And then I need to say uh, gcloud beta billing. And all of the stuff that we're doing here at the command line, you can also do in the GUI. Um, pretty much everything you can do, you can do in the GUI. Uh, the command line utility has most everything that you can do in the GUI, but some of it's still beta commands. So accessing your billing uh, stuff is still beta as far as the command line utility is concerned. So gcloud beta billing projects link, and then I'm gonna say that I want to link the project ID that we just created with my billing account. Sorry, I have to move the, the videos. Billing account and I doubt that anyone could access my billing account just by knowing its ID. Um, oh, I didn't actually get that yet. Okay. So And I'm gonna pipe this to dev null or redirect it to dev null. Um, if you're not familiar with bash, this is just saying, uh, take what would be the normal output of this command and redirect it into the void uh, so that it doesn't output on the screen. Um, just in case my billing account ID is information that I shouldn't be exposing. Okay, so this is going to link the project ID and then you tell it the billing account, but I'm embedding this command to get the billing account information. Okay, so now that stuff is set up and this, it's important to point out that this is stuff you know, if you're making an actual project that's long lived for an actual web application, this is stuff that you're only ever gonna have to do once. Um, okay, so we've done the before you begin stuff and now we'll get into the fun part. So like I said, we're gonna use Go, but yeah, they have examples here for all of these other languages, Ruby, Shell, and if you go to other here, Kotlin, Swift, Dart, Rust, Elixir, C++, and other uh, will link you to the community samples, which has Haskell and all different kinds of other things. Okay, so I've already uh, created this directory here, but you, you know, you'd create a directory for your application. And in the case of Go, um, you have this mod file so let me change into the directory that I've created here. Tutorials and building. Okay, 
So if I open up the mod file, this is how packages are. So the thing about Go is if you're familiar with JavaScript, um, I'm not that familiar with Java, so I'm not sure maybe somebody can tell me uh, what, how the terminology works there. But um, what JavaScript calls packages, Go calls modules, and what JavaScript calls modules, Go calls packages. So it's a little uh, different if you're coming from the JavaScript world. Um, so this module line is telling uh, Go, is telling the compiler what, where our um, module is located and what it's called. Um, and then normally this file would contain your dependencies. So this would be similar to like a package.json file um, in a JavaScript project. Um, in this case, this particular hello world example has no dependencies. So we only specify the version of Go that it uses to compile. So that's all that there is to that file. And this, this stuff right here, I'm gonna just sort of touch on in passing because it's more peculiar to Go than it is to Knative or Google Cloud Run. Okay, so then the file that we created, would have created is uh, this Go file. And so every uh, module needs to have packages in it. Packages are the individual files and each file um, starts out with naming the package. So this particular file, its package name is main. And every Go application needs a main package. So, you know, just like uh, in Java or C sharp or most other languages, you have a main function that is the entry point to your application. In Go, you have a main package and it has a main function. And that's the, you know, that's the minimum sort of structure that you need as the entry point of any sort of Go application. Then we just import some things that we need from the standard library in this case, which is why we didn't have any dependencies. And the important thing to note here, and you know, this is what would translate to Java or C Sharp or any other language really, is that you have to uh, write your service in a way that it's going to um, listen to whatever port is specified by the port environment variable. So here, um, we're just, our handler is sort of like the actual code of the application. So in this case, it's just a hello world example, where if we specify the target uh, environment variable, it'll say hello, whatever target is. Otherwise, it'll default to world. And then it'll just print that out. Um, and then in main here, we're just setting up our web server, right? So this is just how you set up a web server in Go. So we tell it what uh, function we want to serve the, the root URL um, here with this handle func call. And then this is the part that like relates to that container contract. So we have to tell it that the port that we want the server to listen on is whatever port the environment variable port specifies. And then if for some reason we don't have that, we fall back to 8080. And then this is just the go way in which you start a server listening on a particular port. So that's all that there is to that file. And then the other uh, main piece is the Docker file. And so this is sort of like server configuration when you're dealing with containers. This is how we want our server image, our container image to be built. Um, and with containers, if you're not familiar with containers, you want your container images to be as small as possible um, so that you can run more containers on a given server. You're basically trying to maximize your compute resources. Um, so, a uh, Docker file is basically just the configuration, the, the details about how to build your container image. And it has what are called multi-stage builds to facilitate that process of making them as small as possible. So the, the from here is telling it, go out and get the official Golang container image for version 1.13. And that's what our container image is gonna be based on. That's our foundation. 
and we're going to name that builder. We're going to call that uh, stage builder. And then this work directory command is just saying within the image that we're building, we want to create and change directories to a directory called app. And then the copy command is saying whatever directory this Docker file is located in. So, you know, your, your project directory for your application code on your machine, the root of that is where you would generally put your Docker file. And so here we're saying copy any go dot whatever files uh, into our container image. So in this particular example, we just have go dot mod. We'll see a go dot sum file in the next examples, um, but we're just copying those files into our container image. And then we're running go mod download, which is basically, you know, like NPM install for JavaScript. It's just saying, you know, pull in my dependencies, download the, the things that I need. Um, and then here we're copying everything in this root project directory. So basically all of our code um, into the container root. And then we're going to build the binary. So this run command is just using Go, right? It's gonna, it's using the Go compiler to compile the code that we just copied over and it's compiling it into a, a binary application called server. That's, that's our first stage, right? And so what we're doing there is we're using a container image that has Go and that has all of the compile time dependencies that we need to build our application. But those compile time dependencies aren't runtime dependencies. And ultimately to have as small of a container as possible, we want the container to, in its finished state to just be our runtime requirements. So now we're basically starting another stage here on this line where we're saying, okay, I now want to start a new image basically from the official Alpine 3 image. Um, if you're not familiar with it, Alpine is a Linux distribution that is very minimal. It's, it's meant for small containers. Um, and so we start our final image based on that uh, foundation. And then we run APK, which is just the package manager um, in Alpine. So it would be like apt-get in Debian or RPM uh, yum uh, DNF in Red Hat distributions um, or like chocolatey or something like that on a Windows machine. And then we copy the thing that we needed. So our, our first stage built our server binary. And that's the only thing that we really need in our final container image. So here we're saying copy from the previous container, which we named builder, the server that's in the app directory and copy it to just the root server in this uh, image. And then this command, all, all of the things in caps are um, Docker file uh, instructions that you can uh, find details about at uh, docs.docker.com. Um, but the command command is saying, when this container gets started, if no, uh, if no startup command is specified, if, if the, the system that's starting the container just says to start the container without any indication of what to run in the container, this is what should run. So basically when this container starts up, it'll run the server binary. Okay, so that's all of the details of the actual application here. Um, so what we're gonna do next is the actual cloud run Knative deployment stuff. Um, so if you're using cloud run, then uh, there's basically two versions of Cloud Run, the managed Cloud Run, which is what we're looking at, and Cloud Run for Anthos, which is if you wanna sort of run it on your own hardware on site. Um, if you're running it on your own hardware on site, you can use whatever container registry you want. So like Docker Hub or your own private registry. If you're using the Cloud Run managed uh, service, then you need to uh, use the Google Cloud um, 
or the Google Container Repository, which is at this gcr.io. So now what we're going to do, we've got our, let me just show here what's in the, what's in our um, directory. So this is our, you know, the root of our project source code wise. We've got our Docker file, our go.mod and our hello world.go. And so from that, that root of our project, from wherever our Docker file lives, we want to run gcloud uh, builds submit submit and the tag is like the name for the container image so it includes the URL of where it is and what it's called so in the case of Google Container Registry that's going to be gcr.io if it was you know Docker Hub it would be hub.docker.com um, and then in the case of Google Container Registry, the next part of the path is whatever our project ID is, and then it's whatever we want to call our image. So we'll just call this one building and deploying. Okay, so now when I run that, it creates a tarball, tarball um, which is just an archive. Um, that it uploads um, to Google Container Registry. And note here, it says that the cloud build, so cloud build is what um, the service that's building our code and our Docker file into an image is called on Google Cloud Platform. Um, and the fact that we're using all of this stuff in the cloud, and I tested this just to be sure that it was true when I said it, like I could do this on my phone. Like I don't need Go installed on my computer. I don't need Docker installed on my computer. Like none of the stuff that we're employing right now is actually installed on this machine. It's all leveraging resources in the cloud. Um, so what this is saying is I created my project, but I didn't enable the cloud build API. Do I want to enable it? So yeah, I do. And again, this is this enabling of the API, it says it'll take a few minutes. It hardly ever takes that long. Um, but that's another thing that's worth noting is a one-time thing, right? So if this were a long-lived project, every other you know, image creation I do won't require that step. Oh no. Make sure I didn't. I'm hoping that I didn't practice this too many times and forget to delete some things. So what it uploaded to is um, Google Cloud Storage. That's what it uploads the tarball to. Um, and
Let's just try it again. That's the only thing that's in there. The error sounded like I've exceeded some kind of limit. Okay, must have been a momentary fluke. Because yeah, I shouldn't. We can. What we're seeing here is there's only that one tar file in this bucket, and that's the only bucket that I have, um, because I have been practicing this previously, but I've been deleting it each time. So I don't know what happened there, but it was. Uh, just a momentary issue, I guess. So now it's, uh, this is output that you would see if you were just running Docker locally building an image. So that is all of the steps that it's going through to make the different layers of the image that our Docker file specified. And now um, it tells us in the output here what our image is called. So GCR IO, building and deploying our project ID, building and deploying. Okay, so now the next step is to actually deploy that to, to, to run it on Cloud Run. So we've uploaded the actual container image now to um, the container registry, and now we're gonna tell it to, to actually start running instances of that image. Do, do, do Cloud Run deploy. And we'll, we'll see a different uh, approach with the subsequent tutorials, but um, here I'm not gonna specify a name for the service. And so I'm just gonna specify the image that we want to be uh, running as the service. Okay, so when I run this, it will, if you don't specify a service name, it'll suggest one for you, which is just the same as the image name. So, okay, we'll use that. And then again, the run API isn't enabled on the project. So if you, you could preemptively enable it or it'll prompt you like this the first time that you try to use it. All subsequent times again, you know, won't do that. So another, you know, something that happens the first time you set up a project, but not subsequent times. Okay, and since this is just a demonstration where we want to just be able to hit this endpoint, hit the URL for the service in the browser and see our hello world, um, we're going to allow unauthenticated invocations uh, to the service, but normally, you know, you wouldn't want that probably, depending on the nature of your service. I mean, if it's just a completely public web page or something like that, then unauthenticated invocations would be fine in that case too. Okay, so it's building it now and it's deploying it to US Central uh, as the region because I had specified that in my config. You could specify it as part of the command if you wanted it to be different in this particular case than whatever you set up in your config. Um, and uh, my config also said to use the managed run service, um, which is again a one time config setup like the project you would do G Cloud config set run platform to manage, gcloud config set run region to US central one or whatever region you wanted it to use. Any questions so far while this is deploying? Um, I have like a super pedestrian question. Um, so it's not gonna be, obviously you know how my questions are they're not very like in the code related so if you want to field the pedestrian one i i do have one for you oh yeah absolutely any any questions good <clears throat> okay um so like in the beginning you talked a lot about auto scaling which is something i'm familiar with hearing in cloud services in general um but then you also mentioned microservices so am i correct in thinking that a k like a k-native setup is super helpful with a microservice architecture that's getting pinged by traffic at like like all throughout the day like if we had like service a b c and d 
like one or a few of them or all of them may be getting called a lot of the time during certain parts of the day, but then only one or a few of them are being called sparingly at different parts. So the auto scaling with K native is like super helpful in that instance versus like a traditional like cloud hosting environment. Right. And it's, and it's on a service by service basis. So let's say you did have three services that were, you know, interacting to produce your overall application. And, you know, let's say one of those services was the, the main, you know, part of your, of your web app that got most of the traffic. And, you know, maybe another one of those services was some part of your web application that, you know, most users of your web app didn't engage with or something. Um, the, the auto scaling would happen on a service by service basis. So if, you know, one, one service in your overall architecture is getting hit really hard, that would scale up to more containers. But if your other service isn't being hit at all, it would be no containers and no usage costs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that would be like, as opposed to, uh, I guess what I'm assuming to be a traditional like cloud hosted environment where like, uh, or maybe even with like a monolithic application where if a part of it is getting <clears throat> pinged, then your scaling is going up to, to handle all of, all of that traffic, even though like maybe like one eighth of it is being used throughout that traffic or something like that. Right. And if you're using traditional compute resources that aren't serverless, where you're still, you know, they might be virtual machines, right? So like AWS EC2 or uh, Google Cloud Compute, where you're, you know, creating actual virtual machines, you're still, that's not considered serverless because one, you're still managing that virtual machine, right? You're not managing the underlying hardware anymore, but you're still managing that virtual machine and you're paying some rate the whole time that that virtual machine is in existence, right? So even if you've got a monolithic or even, you know, a more microservice app running on that virtual machine or multiple such virtual machines, if let's say your website isn't getting hit at all at particular hours, you're still paying some hourly rate for that virtual machine being in existence. Whereas with this, that's what is meant by it scales to zero. Like if you're not getting any traffic, you're not paying anything because it's running on containers that don't exist at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then just to, to wrap it all up, sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, if uh, so you're running a microservice architecture um, and then you said earlier, like if, uh, if a specific service has like a, um, uh, a maximum amount of, uh, traffic it can handle, uh, and say, for example, we're in a time frame where service A is hitting that max, but like B, C, and D aren't, they're getting like the, the fall off from it or whatever. So if A maxes out because Docker and Kubernetes, then you can just spin up like A2 to handle like the overflow of what main A is taking. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So earlier when you were saying A, B, and C, I thought you meant three different services that were doing different things. But now it sounds like you're talking about three instances of the service that are all serving the same purpose, just serving different traffic. No, no, no. So, no. Yeah, so I, I totally was like A, B, C, and D are different services, but okay. let's say A is getting overloaded and uh -huh. you know, like we're just going to ignore B, C, and D because they're nowhere near capacity. So if A okay. hits capacity because this is like powered on, you know, Docker and Kubernetes, then A is at capacity. We need another A. So we're going to go to like from A1 to like A2. Here's another one. Let's move the traffic over here so we can continue to like handle all right. of this. Yeah, so, okay. so, so an image is like, imagine the, you know, like what's on your hard drive of an actual machine, right? That's like what an image is. It's, it's the file system at rest, basically. You know, what applications are there, what files, that kind of stuff. A container is technically speaking a running instance of that image. So if you have a service, service A, and let's say you just leave the defaults what they are. So the first request to service A will cause a container, an instance of the image that you uploaded 
to start running. And um, that container will then serve up to 80 simultaneous requests per the default settings. But if you start getting, let's say, 100 simultaneous requests, then it'll immediately start running a second container, so a second instance of your image, and, and that'll start you know, serving. And then it'll probably load balance that, so it, it probably won't be that the first container will continue serving 80 requests and the second one will serve 20. It'll probably load balance it more to around 50-50. Um, and then if those two containers were to both hit 80, because you're having, you know, 160 simultaneous requests, then it'll spin up another container. And it'll keep doing that um, up to a thousand container instances per service, unless you cap it. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that's one reason that you might not, you know, want to allow unauthenticated invocations to something that's um, not been appropriately configured yet. For example, like, if you guys were really mean and had a script that was just going to ping this endpoint, you know, a jabillion times, like that might cost me some money. <laughs> so yeah, that that's the thing to keep in mind about about the auto scaling. Okay, cool. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so now we've deployed it, and so now we can. Um, and this is what I was mentioning here. You know, you'd be prompted for a service name if you didn't specify one. If you haven't specified the region in your, um, if it wasn't in my config and I didn't specify it with the command, it would have just prompted me and said, hey, what region do you want? And then we saw we got prompted for unauthenticated invocations. So now I'm gonna do, you know, I could, I could see the URL in the output, um, but I wanted to get rid of it just to show that, you know, if you do that, you can, um, you know, like we've done with other commands. So G Cloud Run Services list is going to list all of our services that are running. And I can do this formatting again, where in this case, I want, I say I want the value of status address uh, URL. And so then that gives me, that'll output me the, the URL. And you know, obviously, if this is an app that you want running at a domain that you own, you can set up, you know, DNS to, to, to map your domain to this. Um, but this can, even if you do that, even if you set up your own domain to map to this route, this route will still exist and and be functional. So you know, your, if you have multiple services the services can talk to each other via these um, generated links, if that's easier. Okay, so if I click on this, we should get hello world in the browser. Now the first time, so there was a little bit of a delay there. This is another thing to note about containers is they scale to zero, but the sort of downside of what that means is if you haven't had any traffic yet, or you've just come through a lull where you didn't have any traffic, there's what's called cold boot time. So the amount of time that it takes to actually boot up a container instance, right? And so since we had never hit this endpoint before, there were no containers in existence to serve it. And so that's what that, you know, like second or so delay was in, in getting the output. You know, if I refresh it again, you know, it, it refreshes immediately because the container's there and live. If I were to let this go a while and the container gets, you know, discarded because there's no traffic, then I, I notice that delay again. And so that, that cold boot time is another reason that you want your container images to be as small as possible, why you want to do those multi-stage builds. Um, because the faster your uh, image boots, the less, you know, of those brief sort of delays you're going to have when you don't have any containers running currently. Okay, so to cloud projects delete. And so, you know, if you're just doing tutorials, it's recommended create a project specific to the tutorial that you're doing. This is why I was confused about that storage quota error, because um, if you create a project and then you're done doing the tutorial or whatever, if you then delete the project, it deletes all the resources associated with that project. So um, 
that's why I was confused why it seemed like there were some resources from before, but in fact there weren't. So um, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to clean up. Um, I mean, you could just keep track too of what uh, resources you created and then delete those individual resources, but having a separate project and deleting the whole thing is just a little bit cleaner. Okay, so that is just, you know, the takeaway from that, there was a lot of setup to the project and that kind of stuff, but I really want to emphasize that that's a one-time thing. The main thing that you would do, you know, on a sort of iterative basis, and even this kind of stuff, you can automate by having it auto build the image when you uh, commit to Git, is, you know, make whatever code, you write whatever code, you write a Docker file to define the image um, that's going to contain the compiled version of that code. Um, and then you upload that to your container registry and you deploy it to Cloud Run and then it's running. And then, you know, you would like, let's say we went in and made a change to it to say something other than hello world. We would, the only commands that we would do again is that G Cloud uh, build submit command to upload the new image and that G Cloud run deploy image, image name command to deploy the new image. And then at that point, this would start serving that new code um, because it's the routing is automatic to the latest revision. So if you upload a subsequent, if you do a subsequent build submit image, then when that image gets built and you deploy it, um, that automatically becomes the one that is serving the uh, URL unless you tell it, you know, otherwise with the routing, unless you say, okay, I only want, 50% of traffic to go to this new revision and 50% to go to the old, something like that. Okay, and so there I got a 404 error because I deleted the project and, and all of the resources were gone. Um, when you delete the project, we might see this on the other tutorial, sometimes it'll still be serving, right, because the container might still be in existence. So until the container itself gets shuttled, it's still serving traffic potentially. So that the deletion of the project might not immediately destroy the running resources. Okay, so now I'm going to go up to using system packages. And um, so what we have here is again our go.mod file. Um, here we have a require, so we're um, involving some dependencies. So that's just how you specify a dependency in this case. That's really more a Go specific than a Knative specific. Um, and then this is the sum file that I was talking about. Again, this just has to do with dependencies. It's an auto-generated file. It would be like a package lock file in JavaScript. It's just making sure that when you do subsequent builds, you get the same versions of the dependencies that you built with before. Um, Okay, so let me see here. Oops. So yeah, graph is .go. Okay, so what we're what we're doing in this tutorial here is we're going to use a system package. So we're going to use a command line utility called graph is that generates diagrams, um, like little flow charts. And we're going to use that, we're going to package that into our container, and we're going to call that in our app in order to produce some output. So let me jump back over here. And these, um, these tutorials here at the bottom sort of build on each other. So we're just going to do these first two ones. But, you know, if you want to learn more about the full life cycle of, of things and, and get into the security of it and whatnot, then, you know, the, each of these builds on the previous one. So right here, we're doing using system packages. Okay, and so same before you begin kind of stuff, create a project, enable billing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Actually, before we get into this file, let me do that quick. Gcloud create a 
projects, create. And we'll call this one using system packages and set it as default. Take the auto generated ID. Project ID variable to that project ID. And then enable billing. Okay, this is where I didn't do this last time, but I'm going to create this so we can reuse it. Beta billing accounts. Format value name okay. G Cloud Beta Billing. This is this is one area where the um, GUI is uh, got a little bit more automation in it. So if you create a project with the GUI, it'll automatically link the uh, billing account to the project. So you don't need to, you know, if you just have one billing account, every new project you create, um, you can go. Oops, the, sorry, the zoom things in the way of my tabs. you can go to new project here. And it's the same sort of like stuff that we're specifying at the command line, what you want the project name to be. Here's the auto generated name that it would give it if you have an organization where you want to put it. And if you create it that way, then um, it'll automatically link the billing account. to dev mulligan. Okay. So now our project's good to go. Okay. And yeah, we've discussed that. This is what I was mentioning. If you want to set up your run region and your config. Um, okay. And so the code samples. So this is, this is the architecture that we're doing here. So, you know, the user, when we hit it with the browser, we're going to be making an HTTP request. That's going to hit our service. Our service is going to make a system call to the graphis.cli. That's going to spit out the actual graph results that our web service is then just going to hand back to our browser as the HTTP response. And so, do, 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 do. yeah. So if we go back here and look at the file, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really kind of breeze through this because this is more Go specific. Um, but basically, again, we're telling it some routing here. So we're saying we want our diagram handler function to uh, serve traffic at the diagram.png uh, route. We're again checking for what the port environment variable is set to and listening on that port. This is our diagram handler function. So it's just checking some, handling some potential errors basically. So we only wanna accept get requests and we want to, those get requests are gonna have a query string that is the input to the dot command line utility. Um, so this is extracting that kind of stuff from the URL um, and reporting errors if the 
if the syntax is bad or that sort of thing. And then this create diagram, which is what the um, diagram handler function invokes, this create diagram function is what's gonna actually be calling a command line utility. So this is like something that you couldn't do, you know, with a functions as a service, you know, Google Cloud Functions or AWS Lambda. You couldn't have, you know, you couldn't package a command line utility or make a system call, you know, from your application. Um, whereas here you can, as long as it's an executable that's, you know, been compiled to be Linux 64-bit. Uh, Okay, so that's the actual um, code that we're compiling. And then here's the Docker file in this case. So lots of comments. Um, again, a multi-stage build. So first we have to actually build the Go application. So we're gonna start with the Golang image that has the compiler and everything in it. Create our app directory, copy over our dependency specifying files, um, run, Go mod download, which actually downloads our dependencies into the image. We're going to copy our code over, um, and then we're going to run the Go compiler to build our server binary again. And then this time, the second stage isn't using Alpine, it's using uh, Ubuntu. And we're going to run apt-git to install our command line uh, graphics utility. And then we're going to clean up apt-git again, just in interest of keeping our container image uh, small. And this is where we pull the built binary from the first stage of the image creation. And then again, we tell it any time that we start a new container from this image, server is what it should run. So very, very similar. The only real difference here is that we're using a different distribution for our final container probably because Alpine didn't have Graphiz built into its package manager. Okay, so then the deployment is largely the same as what it was before. So shipping the code, we've got our code and um, you know, we're in our root directory where our Docker file is. We've got our code. Most of the other code in here that we didn't touch on is tests that the uh, person who created the sample, you know, put in here just to test their work. Um, so that's why we only looked at a few of the files in there. But so now we're in that directory where our Docker file is. So we can do gcloud builds, submit, tag, and, um, GCRIO, our project ID, and uh, we'll call this using system packages. Again, this is a new project because I'm creating a new one for each of these examples. So it might seem like this enabling of APIs happens a lot, but it's just sort of an artifact of I'm creating a new project for every example here. Normally you'd have long lived projects for actual applications and you'd only do this once. Okay, so see, you can kind of see, you know, like from Golang there. So now it's going through the steps that we specified in our Docker file to make the different image layers. Um, here it's downloading the Go dependencies that we specified um, because it's running that Go mod download command. This image takes a little longer to build than the last one because of downloading all those dependencies, whereas the last image didn't have any. One thing too to note if you're not familiar with Docker is 
subsequent builds go faster because it will only rebuild layers that it needs to. So for example, you know, we downloaded those dependencies. If none of those dependencies change between now and the next time we build, it will just reuse, you know, what it downloaded the previous time. So, so subsequent builds also happen faster in general than initial builds. Okay, so that's done. And so now we can do gcloud run deploy. And here, so, you know, if we don't want it to suggest a thing for us, we can um, specify our service name up front and our image. Sorry, I have to keep moving the videos. Um, using system packages. Yes, enable the API. And again, we're going to allow unauthenticated invocations here so we can display the output in the browser without having to set up authentication. And this one, okay, so let me, while that's building, um, this one, we're not just going to hit the service URL. We're also going to have this, um, we want to hit the diagram.png route. Um, but then we also have this query string that specifies the input um, for the graph that we want to see. Any questions while this finishes deploying? Okay, there we go. So I'm gonna copy our service URL here. Okay, so then this should generate a diagram for us. Code build deploy run. So it so what happened, just to reiterate here, is it took this digraph specification here, where we said code build deploy run, and it passed that to the, the dot CLI command and got the output of that and then served it back to us. Um, so that's that's something that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with uh, functions as a service. Okay, so I see we are at eight o'clock. Um, are people interested in continuing to the Cloud Pub Sub tutorial? So what this would show different than what we've already seen is how eventing works. So the two tutorials we did so far, we, we just ran the service and we just accessed it unauthenticated through the browser uh, by going to the URL. This uh, using PubSub or something like it is what you would do, you know, in you know, microservices architecture and production. So earlier when we were talking about like a service A, service B, service C, you know, maybe service A does something and it makes a request to service B. And so that request could be made via a publish subscribe model, which is what this 
tutorial talks about. So you have a message queue that service A will publish some request to, and then um, service B would be subscribing to that topic and it would see that message and then it would act on that message and then it might publish a message somewhere else that service C consumes. Um, so basically this tutorial covers the eventing part, how you make these uh, K-native services communicate with each other. Sean, would you maybe want to do that as like a, uh, a part two in the future? Just yeah, sure. All right. Uh, cool, cool. Um, that, uh, because I do want to continue this, but um, because it is eight and I want to give people the rest of their evenings and stuff like that. Yep, no problem. We could totally do that as a part two. So um, does anyone have any questions about anything that was covered tonight? No questions. I mean, this, this is like all new to me uh, as far as like this language and this kind of, it was, it was very interesting. Definitely, definitely a lot. Uh, like I was a little lost at times only because this is definitely new and I'm more like new in the tech fields, but uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. It was very, very eye opening. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I, this group is super supportive of everybody in whatever part of their journey that they're in. So um, I will be uploading this to YouTube uh, tomorrow morning. So if you want to like come back to it in the future and get the, get everything installed that you need installed and follow along, that is going to be very possible. Um, and uh, yeah, Sean, we should totally do a part two to, to finish the rest of this off. Yeah, no problem. And if people want to go through these tutorials and you have trouble setting up the SDK or anything, you know, feel free to message me on Meetup or, or whatever, um, and I can walk you through that. It's just, I, I didn't include that because it really, it depends on your operating system. So it would have been hard to cover it for everybody not knowing, you know, what they're using. But yeah, if you want to run through these tutorials yourselves and you run into any problems, feel free to reach out to me. I got a quick somewhat unrelated question. Um, I'm curious if you have any suggestions on a local Kubernetes server, like what operating system and what core you would use. I mean, obviously there's Docker, but do you have any suggestions for running Docker local? Um, are you on Windows or Linux? Uh, <laughs> well, not to be determined. So everything I've written is in .NET Core, and I have a stack of servers downstairs that are not formatted and ready to go yet. Okay. Um, so um, you, I mean, you might if if you don't have a preference already, you might have an easier go using Linux because. Um, like Kubernetes and Docker started out on Linux. Um, th there's good support now on Windows. Uh, Docker Desktop for Windows has Kubernetes built into it. Um, so there's certainly a lot of support there. I don't mean to suggest that there isn't, but if you don't have a preference, it, you know, it might be in uh, a little bit more documentation and stuff um, if you go the Linux route. And um, there's a, a good O'Reilly book called Kubernetes Up and Running. So if you're interested on in, in putting it on actual physical hardware uh, of your own, um, Kubernetes Up and Running, I think it's Appendix A, uh, tells you how to do it on like a, a cluster of Raspberry Pis, but you could translate that to other, it translates to other hardware um, as well. And you, and you would need, you can't really run Knative yourself on your own hardware without Kubernetes. It runs on top of Kubernetes. So you'd have to install Kubernetes first. If you just want to play around with it on your own hardware um, to get a feel for it, you can use uh, something called Minikube um, that is part of the Kubernetes project. And that will just create VMs um, on your hardware, on your development machine or whatever. Um, to imitate a full cluster, and then you can install 
uh, K Native on top of that. And the 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 K Native um, documentation that I showed here at the beginning. Um, if you go to installing K Native and go to the installation guide. Um, to do it talks about these offerings um, but do you have any experience with OpenShift, Red Hat's OpenShift? Uh, only very limited, um, but OpenShift is uh, basically a distribution of Kubernetes, I think is how they describe it. Um, so yeah, installing OpenShift would be similar to installing Kubernetes. And I think if you're familiar with Ansible, um, that uh, Red Hat has some pre-written uh, Ansible playbooks that will set up an OpenShift cluster for you. And uh, there's a corollary to Minikube called MiniShift that is like a local set of VMs to imitate an OpenShift cluster. So yeah, that's that. It, it's definitely. I, I would recommend. I've I've started reading. I haven't finished Kubernetes up and running, but if you're interested in running Kubernetes yourself, that seems like a really good book um, to you know to get it going. But it yeah, it's a it's a whole it's a whole lot more complicated than just using Knative, right? What we were covering here was just how to use Knative, setting it up is its own separate thing. Um, it's, you know, something that I'm looking into that we could also potentially touch on in a subsequent talk if there's interest, but yeah. Uh, yeah, based off of current trends, I'm sure there would be a massive interest in that. Matt, did you have any more um, follow-up questions or comments or anything like that? No, that was a little off cuff. You know, in my world, I'm still working on the services that will run on these servers, so I'm a little ways away from that. But I'm, I'm you know, always interested in figuring out how I'm going to set this. I basically have a cluster of servers I've been collecting for about a year and a half, so um, very excited to get them all up and running locally and running in house. As yeah, well and I mean, one thing you could do if you just wanted to test your application up front um, and make sure that it worked well, you know, with, with Knative in terms of architecture and stuff is, you know, you could probably uh, test it on like Cloud Run or one of the other managed Knative services in a way that wouldn't cost you anything, you know, and then you know that, okay, yeah, this works on Knative and now I just need to, you know, get a Kubernetes cluster set up. 